join me in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. I want to uh, discuss further the importance of building a stronghold of the Word. In our previous sessions, we've talked about uh, God being our stronghold. We saw from Nahum 1, 7 that the Lord is good. He is a stronghold in the day of trouble. We found that God is not changing. He is not uh, unstable. He, there is no variableness in him or shadow of turning. But God is established and his word is established and he has provided us his word so that we can bring his word into our life and establish our lives upon his word causing us to have the stability that God designed for us. And so as we look here at 2 Corinthians chapter 10, I want to see other strongholds. And we're going to make that uh, contrast between the strongholds that the enemy would try to establish in our life and how he attempts to establish those strongholds and then recognize that those same methods are how God designed for us to establish a stronghold of health, a stronghold of prosperity, a stronghold of the peace of God, a stronghold of our righteousness. All of those godly strongholds are necessary and they are God's plan for our lives. And so 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 3 says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. So here we've already seen that there is a distinction between the natural, the carnal, or the flesh and what we're about to see, which is spiritual. The weapons of our warfare, it, though it, it, we could say this, they are not carnal, we could say they are spiritual. If they're not carnal, what are they? They're spiritual. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, they're spiritual, and they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations. And so casting down imaginations and casting down every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So we see three operations of these spiritual weapons that we've been provided. We see a pulling down, we see a casting down, and we see a bringing into captivity. These are the operations of the spiritual weaponry that God has provided for us, casting down, pulling down, casting down, bringing into captivity. Amen? Pulling down, casting down, bringing into captivity. And they are working in areas that we would call mental or in the mind. It, we see... Uh, Imaginations, we know imaginations are things that take place in the mind. Imaginations and things that exalt against the knowledge of God, that would be knowledges or, or, or ideas or plans or um, uh, thought patterns that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. We see it says bringing into captivity every thought. Well, we know then thoughts are in the mind. So these spiritual weapons are meant to operate in the defense of the mind, in the defense of wrong things being built in our mind. And when we look at the different categories, we see there are three categories and they are listed from strongest to weakest. It says the strongholds. 
A stronghold is something that is established, and it's established over time. It is not something that just came into your mind yesterday, but it's something, it's a thought pattern that has been practiced and practiced and practiced until it becomes entrenched in that person's way of thinking. We looked this morning at God being a stronghold for us and wanting to develop his word in our life as a stronghold in those specific areas. And now we see that the enemy also would desire to establish wrong things in our life that not just one wrong idea, but wrong ideas that have been practiced and become entrenched in the life of a person until they are in bondage to that thought or limited by that thought or hindered by that thought until that thought becomes an obstacle in their walk with God, in their ability to fulfill completely what God wants. And so this stronghold being the, the highest level or strongest form of a thought, we would take the next step down then and see that imaginations are a step down from that. Imaginations have details with them. They have a plan with them. You can see something playing out in your mind. I, I like to refer to it as that video that plays in the mind. Have you ever had a, something that you were worried about and you worried it all the way out to the end of it, to the worst possible scenario, right? And so that's an imagination. It came complete with details and video for you to play in your mind, right? You know, that for that person who is up at night and their, their teenager hasn't come home yet and they are up and they're worried and they are uh, saying that, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? What if they're out? What if they've wrecked the car? What if they've gotten arrested? And they are going through all of these imaginations, right? And so imaginations being that second level, not as weak as a thought, but not as strong as that stronghold that has been built. And then it brings us then to the thought, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So if I capture that thought at thought level, it does not become an imagination. And if I keep it from becoming an imagination and I keep it from having any activity in my mind, I can prohibit it from having a stronghold in me, right? We see that these are, are uh, levels and they are parts of the process. So if the enemy wants to get somebody off track, he can't get in their spirit. He can't get into their heart because there's no duplex in your heart. You are wall to wall filled with the life of God, right? So what does he have to do? He has to get into that thinking. He has to get into the mind and he has to do it with a thought. And so the word devil is not a name. The word devil is not a name. If you investigate the, that word, it is a description of how he operates. Diabolos. It is a two-part word, and, and one of the parts of that word, it means to continue to hit against something, to hit, to hit, to hit, to hit, to constantly just barrage and hit that mind and hit that mind with that wrong thought. And the second part of the word means to pierce. So the enemy, how he operates is to come against the mind consistently, balos, to hit like you're throwing a ball against the, that uh, wall. He, he's throwing and throwing and throwing and throwing, hitting that, you with that thought for the intention of piercing to get the thought into the mind. So devil is not his name. It's his method of operation. Amen. Now, we're looking at this just to recognize how the process works because the devil did not create the process. The devil did not come up with the idea of getting the thought in the mind and then establishing that person on that thought. That was God. God did that from the beginning. 
He said from the beginning, hearken diligently to the voice of the Lord your God to observe and to do all these. Why? He said, if you'll listen to my word, if you'll continue in my word, if you'll abide in my word, if, you'll, if you will, uh, uh, this book of the law, he said in Joshua 1.8, this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate therein. So he wants it in your mouth, and if he gets it in your mouth, where is it? It's in your mind. If I'm talking it, I have to think about what I'm saying. So the way for me to govern the mind is to have God's word in my mouth. So God originated this. He even says it in Psalm chapter 1. Psalm chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. He said, uh, I'll just go ahead and read the whole text. Turn over there with me. Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. How do I... This, these are walking, standing, sitting. These are activities. These are actions for my life. How do I refrain from these actions? How do I keep myself from wrong actions? Our delight is in the law of the Lord. And the word law means teaching instrument. We would say today in the word of God. My delight is in the teachings, the word of the Lord. And in his word, I meditate day and night. Again, this word meditate has a definition that includes the saying. It means to mutter. To mutter, so you're saying it to yourself, but you're vocalizing it nonetheless. You are employing your mouth to govern your thoughts. You are using your mouth, your, your voice-activated spiritual authorization to cause your mind to think about what God said. Amen? So he said that we delight in the Word and we meditate in the Word day and night. And because of that, we are like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth fruit in our season. Our leaves shall not wither, and whatever we do shall prosper. Hallelujah. Whatever we do shall prosper. How can it be that whatever we do prospers because we are feeding on the correct thing. And we, that means we've got the right strongholds in our mind. We've got godly strongholds. We've got godly uh, established principles and established truths. And if you know the truth, you won't be deceived. If you know the truth, if you know the truth, you'll recognize counterfeit. When they take bank tellers and prepare them to be able to discern the difference between a real $100 bill and a counterfeit, they don't bring a lot of counterfeits and make them study the counterfeits. They bring the real, and they want them to feel it. They want them to see it. They want them to be so, so familiar with, so intimate with the real $100 bill. I, we need to be intimate with some $100 bills, right? We need to be, I know what, the, I know what a $100 bill feels like it right here in my pocket. But they become so, so aware of the real that if a, if a, counterfeit comes into their hand, their hand knows it. Their hand can say, that doesn't feel like the real $100 bill. Let me look closer. And then they begin to look at it and they say, that doesn't look like a real $100 bill. And then they're looking for the details of what should be in the real. And God wants us so strongly established in truth that deceit is, is automatically recognized. When the enemy tries to bring something counterfeit, when he tries to bring a wind of doctrine that is not an established truth, when he tries to bring uh, uh, something and, and call it the moving of the Spirit, that we're recognized, wait a minute, that doesn't sound like the real. That doesn't feel like the real. That doesn't have the same quality that the truth has. Amen? So this establishing on the Word of God, this 
meditating in the word or receiving God's word at thought level and imagining it till the point that it becomes a stronghold in our life, that was God's original plan and the enemy has just used it in the negative direction. And how has he done that? By presenting his thoughts instead of God's thoughts. If he gets someone focused on the wrong thoughts and meditating on the wrong thoughts and accepting the wrong thoughts, then he can get them to act out in that direction. What does it say here? That we're not walking incorrectly, we're not standing incorrectly, we're not sitting incorrectly. And why aren't we having those incorrect actions? It's because we've been feeding on the right thing, which leads us in the right actions and behaviors for our life. Amen? Go ahead and let's look at Joshua 1, because uh, it has a similar result, and I think we need to, to see that it's not all up to God, it's... It depends on what we're feeding, how we're working the system he's provided for us. Joshua 1, 8, This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. Out of your mouth, because if it's in your mouth, your mind is focused on it. And you are authorizing it in your life. The word shall not depart out of your mouth, but you will meditate. And again, that word includes a definition. It, it means to imagine. It means to ponder. It means to think about. But it also means to mutter, to, to speak it to yourself. So you will meditate therein day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written therein. Does that have to do with our behavior? To do what's written therein. In other words, if I've got it as my focus and I am feeding on the thoughts that come from God's word, then I'm going to be acting in that direction. My behavior will be motivated by that which I'm feeding on, this truth of God's word. And it says that then you will make your way prosperous. Do you see then, it's not God making our way prosperous. It is because it's His Word that's really the motivation behind the pros prospering of our lives. It's really His Word because we've been feeding on His Word. But He said that, that walking out of it's going to be because in our life. We will make our way prosperous. Why? Because we're seeing everything in truth. We're seeing light and we're going to live out that light. And we will avoid the darkness and avoid the wrong behaviors and avoid the things that will become a pitfall because we are feeding on the right thing. We are taking God's thoughts and establishing our imaginings, our imaginations, and establishing the strongholds that become for us a protection. The strongholds of the enemy are places of of slavery. They are places of bondage. Addiction is a stronghold. Phobias are strongholds. Fear of rejection, fear of heights, fear of whatever. Those are, those are thoughts that have been practiced and imagined until they gain an entrenchment. They hold a place, they hold territory in your life. Amen? And so those are the enemy's strongholds that he desires, but the weapons of our warfare can pull them all down. And that means that we don't have to be victim to any addiction. We don't have to be victim to any phobias. We don't have to be victim to uh, prejudice or racism, or we don't have to be uh, victim to any of those wrong thoughts. We can pull all those wrong strongholds down in our life, and we can take God's Word and establish His truth as a refuge for us. It won't be a bondage to us. For us, it'll be a refuge. And God will be the one who holds territory in our life. God's flag will be flying from your castle. Amen? And he is the Prince of Peace. And so he said, you will make your way prosperous. And you will have good success. 
Hallelujah. Why? Because you've meditated and you have fed on and you have focused on the thoughts of God and allowed the thoughts of God to be the established focus of your life. Proverbs 4 identifies the same concept. Proverbs chapter 4 is one that I am continually uh, taken back to. It's, it's, it's an, uh, such a standard for our lives that it cannot be overlooked and, and us experience the blessing and the favor and the victory that God has. We, we can't overlook Proverbs 4 and really walk out the fullness of God's plan. He says in verse 20, My son, attend to my words. Attend. How do I attend to the word of God? He wants you to know specifically what kind of attention to give to his word. He said, incline your ear unto my sayings. Well, if you do that, what's going to happen? Faith will come. Faith comes by hearing. He said, incline thine ear unto my sayings. And then he says, in addition to that, let them not depart from your eyes. So for you to hear it, you can hear it preached like you're hearing it preached today, or you can speak it to yourself, which is just as vital for our life. Amen? And he said that's going to cause the hearing of it, and don't let it depart from your eyes. It needs to be something that we're looking at. It needs to be something that we are putting in and not just reading, but, but focusing. Focusing and seeing it and allowing it because that's how we're going to get it in the heart. He said, keep them in the midst of your heart. Keep them in the midst of your heart. So the objective is to get the word in the heart. To, to allow the ear gate and the eye gate. That's how the Dakes, uh, uh, God's plan for man. He always in, included the ear gate and the eye gate. That's the gate to the heart. So for us to get it into the heart, which is where it will produce faith and the spiritual strength and nutrition that we need, we've got to give our attention, inclining our ear, not letting it depart from our eyes so that we have an abundance of the word in the heart. And when we have the word in the heart, we have a treasure. He referred to our treasure in Matthew chapter 12. He said, out of the good treasure of the heart, you can bring out good things. Amen? If you don't have it treasured in the heart, how are you going to bring out anything good? If, if a person is treasuring up the problem and they're storing up the problem, and they've got the problem in their eyes, and they've got the problem in their ears, and they're talking the problem, and they're thinking the problem, and they're meditating the problem, then all they're going to be able to withdraw from the heart is problem. But he said that we can take his word, his supernatural supply of creative power, and we can put his word in our heart. And when we have his word in our heart, we've got a good treasure to access. We can bring out health if we need health because we've stored some health. We've been putting 1 Peter 2.24 in the heart. We have a treasure of 1 Peter 2.24. We have a treasure of Matthew 8.17. We have a treasure of Isaiah uh, in our heart so that we can pull out the treasure of God's Word. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's the desire of God that we have a supply, a stronghold, a treasure for us to be able to access in time of need. And so whether it be peace or healing or, or financial stability, whatever the need may be, there's a seed for you to put in the heart so that you can withdraw. Amen. Amen? And out of the good treasure, hallelujah, we can bring forth good things. Out of the stronghold of the word, we can bring forth a supply. Hallelujah. Isn't God good? Isn't God good? And so that doesn't leave you victim to wait on somebody else to do it. God says, just get in the word and store it up. Just store it up. Just store it up. Hallelujah. That's the supply and that's the plan. Glory to God. 
Hello everyone, we are so excited about what God's doing in your life and in the ministry of Faith Builders. Michelle and I wanted to take a moment today and talk to you about partnership. And I know there's a lot of talk about partnering with ministries and uh, that word partnership is used a lot, but it's a spiritual principle. Yes. And I want you to look in the book of Philippians chapter four uh, very often we go right to verse 19, but my God shall supply all of your need according to his riches and glory. But it starts back in verse 15. And Paul says, now you Philippians know that in the beginning of the gospel, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but you only. The word communicated in the Greek means to give or to share in all good things. The Amplified uses the term, no, no church opened up a credit and debit account with me or with this ministry except you. Yes. So Paul says that this church at Philippi entered into a giving and receiving relationship with him. As they gave into his ministry, they received. Now, the easy thing to look and see there is that that's financial, but the aspect of it is there's a spiritual connotation as well. When you get involved in partnering with a ministry and you open up that credit and debit account, he says God will supply all of your need yes. according to his riches in glory, his riches of anointing, his riches of glory, his riches of spiritual victory, and his riches of physical finances. I want to encourage you today, if you've not yet partnered with us, I want to encourage you to do so because the blessing of the Lord will begin to function in your life in unprecedented man ways because you enter into this account with us as we spread the gospel. God bless you. Thank you for your partnership. We have many ways that you can connect with us through your generous giving or prayers. Not only will your seed into this ministry help spread the gospel, it will produce a harvest in your own life. You can sow online, by mail, or by phone. Thank you for your faithful partnership. This is Pastor Philip Steele, and I want to invite you out to Little Rock's new Word of Faith Church, Faith Builders Church, right here in Little Rock, Arkansas. Our address is 10500 Markham. We have services Sunday morning at 10 a.m., Sunday nights at 6 p.m., and Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m., our hour of power. If you're hungry for the moving of the gifts of the Spirit, the gifts of healing, the working of miracles, if you're hungry for the moving of the Holy Ghost, then we're the church for you. We value the Word of God and believe that the Word of God is the answer to all of your problems. We have a whole slate of services that are available for your family. We have nursery ministry, children's ministry, and youth ministry, all geared towards building your faith and framing your world by the Word of God. I'd really love to see you. Come and see us, and until then, God bless you.